I started working in the tunneling industry 16 years ago, four years into my career. At that time, it was still very much a dirty and dangerous business, and the working environment was challenging and harsh. I spent long and arduous hours underground without much amenities or guidance. And most of my work revolved around menial tasks of arranging logistics and reports. As with most other entry-level engineers in the construction industry, tunneling technology and engineering efforts in those earlier days were focused on making tunnel boring machines or TBMs in short ever bigger and stronger. The industry was also focused on inventing new tunneling methods to tunnel in increasingly difficult terrain and previously untunnelable geology. As we humankind continue to expand our transportation and infrastructure networks, one of the technically impossible geologies to tunnel in at the time was our notoriously challenging karstic limestone formation, found in the very heart of Kuala Lumpur. In other words, Tunneling back then was still very much about conquering new frontiers rather than sparing thoughts to making tunneling works less labour intensive or more productive. As a young engineer back then, I thought this could not be the way we continue to do things. I was determined that if I were to remain in the industry, things would have to change. I took heart, however, to the fact that I was working on the world's largest tunnel boring machine at the time and was learning from the very best tunneling experts in the world on the project. I was the pioneer group of Malaysian tunnelers building modern tunnels for Malaysia. There was too much to learn and take in then while I let my itch for change linger. Eight years ago, I started heading the tunneling division for the organization that I currently work for and have served for 20 years. During this time, I have delivered several of the nation's major road and rail tunnels, including our country's first MRT tunnels. I have also assembled and groomed a formidable young team of tunnelers who together helped me build these tunnels for Malaysia. In 2012, with the help of my mentors and industry experts, we developed a new tunneling invention that finally made tunneling in the technically impossible karstic limestone geology of Kuala Lumpur possible. We call it the Variable Density Tunnel Boring Machine, or now popularly known worldwide as the VDTBM. This invention was vital to enable the MRT tunnels to reach Kuala Lumpur's central business districts, which are primarily underlain by this karstic limestone formation. For the uninitiated, simply imagine a magnificent limestone caves like the Gua Muru, Gua Tempurong, or Batu Caves, but completely underground, right beneath us. Tunneling in this labyrinth of caves is just difficult and unimaginable, a new frontier until the advent of the invention of the VDTBMs. Past utility and LRT tunnels in Kuala Lumpur had intentionally skirted away from the limestone areas when the engineers drew up their alignments, resulting in suboptimal alignments and not maximizing the impact of these infrastructures, simply because they did not have the technology to handle this geology at that time. But then, our joy of finally conquering this new frontier brought ourselves a new problem. Nobody knew how to operate these machines. With the exception of the few engineers who designed the machine, no one else in the industry had operated similar machines before. All fully understood the concepts behind it. With the incredibly steep learning curve coupled with the fact that I had to master teams to quickly man 10 TBMs, I was in for some serious trouble. Kudos to my top executives who dealt with this by investing in the setting up of 
possibly the world's first contractor established tunneling training academy. Training started early to provide ample time to upskill the massive number of operators and engineers needed to man the new TVMs correctly. The stakes were high as we would be traversing under major roads and structures in the most crowded and dense sections of the city. These angst further drove me to the brainchild of building a TBM simulator in our training academy. I utilized an actual TBM control cabin to simulate scenarios to train operators to react appropriately to possible real-life situations. Not unlike those simulators that pilots use to learn how to fly. The lessons learned on developing this TBM simulator would later prove to be the base of our pursuit of the autonomous TBM. Now, many of you might be enjoying our first MRT in Kuala Lumpur, which is an efficient subway deserving of a world-class metropolitan that we can be proud of. But you may not know that the works behind building these tunnels are still very laborious and heavily reliant on the feel and experiences of individuals. You may also not know of my incessant anxiety over the performance of my operators and engineers, although fully trained in operating the TBMs, and whether they will make a mistake anytime. I've previously compared my situation with the commercial airline flying planes with no autopilot. And you can just imagine the CEO's anxiety over his airline's operations being dependent solely on the competency and reliability of his pilots. Probably an absurd and even dangerous thought. In 2016, we won the contract to build the tunnels for the second MRT line in Kuala Lumpur. And this time round, I vowed to make a change. I simply refused to continue to allow the safety of the public and of my workers to rest solely in the hands of operators and their performance. I simply cannot accept that there is nothing more I can do but to train vigorously and to supervise closely. And I also had no intention of having to endure the same anxiety all over again as I experienced on building MRT1. This time the work scope is 40% larger, using up to 12 TBMs concurrently. The opportunity, or rather the ordeal of having to manage more than 10 TBMs under a single contract performed by a single contractor is very rare and sparingly attempted by both clients and contractors around the world alike. But I have had the honour to do it twice. The expectation of the nation for timely and safe delivery of the MRT tunnels rests on me. Once again, we have to traverse under the densely populated centre of Kuala Lumpur and through the difficult but no longer impossible Cassic Limestone geology. And to make things more perturbing, we updated the VD technology from experiences learned in MRT1, which meant the operators would have to relearn and retrain again. And so I decided to take an untrodden path. I decided to automate our TBM operations. I needed to remove the sole reliance on humans from the equations. Not only did I decide that we must automate, but I was also convinced that we had to do this in-house. And this was probably fundamental to our ability to achieve a quick, cheap and agile delivery of our objectives. The team eventually consists of five diverse individuals who, in their own ways, each helped me piece together this journey towards an autonomous TBM. John, an ingenious young engineer whom we discovered almost by chance when we put him to exploring the programming algorithms to auto-steer the TBM because he broke his arm and was office-bound for a few months. He has written all our algorithms ever since. Russ, an enormously experienced superintendent who has worked on improving TBM programmable logic and controls all his life. He was the first to convince me that my peculiar aspirations were not crazy after all. Gus, 
my mentor who has been instrumental throughout my 16 year tunneling career and who first pioneered a crude but successful attempt to auto steer a TBM in Lesotho in the 90s. Gus provided pivotal guidance and mentorship to me and the whole team. Justin, my deputy of eight years, pulled the team together and made the impressive pitch to the International Tunneling Association, which won us the Innovation of the Year Award last year for the Autonomous TBM. And Sam, another bright engineer who helped implement the project throughout and shared the meetings from the operators. It has been my honour to have worked with these individuals and to have them share my ambition. The result is made extra satisfying for the fact that I did not have a formal grant or budget. Working between project resources, I took it upon myself to initiate and pull this through. Portion by portion, starting with steering, then extraction screw control, then slurry circuit control and so forth. We managed to automate the sub-functions that make up the full operation of a TBM. Honestly, you would be surprised and maybe even shocked if you look at how we typically operate modern TBMs with no automation. Often, we have one and occasionally two operators having to look at five different screens displaying over 400 different data points so they can make constant adjustments to scores of knobs and dials that control the various equipment in the TBM. At best, it is a tiring and highly unreliable task for human beings to attempt to do well, if not impossible. The operator will innately learn to focus only on a handful of data that is essential and ignore the rest until he has completed the adjustments at hand before shifting to the next ones. Chances of him missing a non-routine change in parameters is extremely high despite alarm prompts on the screen when extraordinary situations occur because the operator had just way too many things to look at at one time. The operators are simply data overloaded. It is also interesting to note that even when the operator is working on a handful of data in each step of focus. He is merely reactive to the parameters he sees and making small adjustments to return the values to a preset range. A predictable discovery is that not only can the computer do it faster and more accurately, but it can also look at all tasks at once. The autonomous modules that we developed do just that. There are also circumstances when the operator would have to react to extraordinary events, for example, an unexpected ground condition or a sudden breakdown of a component. Experienced operators would be able to spot these circumstances and take reactionary actions quickly to stabilize the situations. Our autonomous modules, therefore, must also recognize these situations and to know how to react accordingly. Fortunately, unlike the developers of autonomous cars or vehicles, we do not have to deal with the complications of traffic or the possibility of having to react to someone beating a red light or suddenly cutting, or suddenly cutting into our lanes. Our TBMs move at a snail-like pace of only 25 mm a minute so reacting at speed was not the priority of our research. Our focus was to break down the workflows of the TBM operation into modules and test out simulations to teach the algorithms to learn to react to situations. However, developing AI algorithms for the autonomous TBM, or ATBMs as we fondly call it, was particularly challenging and dissimilar to autonomous cars where large, high-quality datasets are available. Tunneling data is a notoriously guarded trade secret, and collaborative data sharing is almost unheard of in this industry. The unique scale of our MRT2 project, with a total of 16 tunnel drives utilizing 12 TBMs and spanning 13 and a half kilometer within a single package, allowed us access to a reasonably sized dataset 
in addition to data from RT1. These were key factors of our success. Technical problems aside, securing buy-in from various stakeholders, both external and internal, required time and active open communication to persuade of the robustness and safety of such a system. The project client has been very progressive and supportive of our efforts in developing the ATVM despite risk of failure. And for this, I am very grateful. Internal challenges emerged also in the form of reluctance from operators to use the system as they felt they were being replaced or that they had less control over the operation. This was addressed via active engagement with the operators continually requesting feedback from them to fine-tune the system's behaviour and ensuring that our algorithms were not black boxes. All decisions made by the ATVN can be visualised, dissected and made clear to all stakeholders to increase confidence in the system. In the near future, my vision is to base the TBM operators at centralised command and control centre to remotely monitor multiple TBMs concurrently, transforming the traditional TBM operator's role from semi-skilled to highly skilled work. TBM operators will no longer just operate TBMs, but rather look at other key things such as instrumentation and settlement data to hopefully make better decisions. Currently, contractual clauses still obligate that an operator must remain in the operator's cabin but it is hoped that this requirement can soon be waived with the increased confidence in the system. I believe the autonomous TBM is a real tunneling game changer. With autonomous control comes increased efficiency, productivity and ultimately a higher quality tunnel view. With autonomy, we are capable of faster response time and unbiased decision making. Operator errors due to fatigue or cognitive overload can now be avoided, resulting in lower risks and safer tunneling for the contractor and most importantly, the general public. With all projects involving autonomy, questions of liability are important to answer as technology becomes more pervasive. But these are discussions that must be tackled together to form common frameworks of understanding. Instead of organizations doing disparate research, collaboration is important to bring confidence for widespread industry adoption. With quick data and lessons learned, quickly leading to more bold innovations in this space. Our journey towards an autonomous TBM has just started. And I hope to light a spark in the tunneling community, inspiring the adoption of more digital technologies within the industry. I am confident that our innovation will give rise to a ripple effect that will extend throughout and upskill the level of safety and quality of board tunneling around the world. Thank you.